There we are. Now we're live everywhere else. Welcome to all my other social media. Sorry, I forgot to hit the button on time. Uh, I'm Dr. Wendy Walsh. I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I teach at California State University Channel Islands in the psychology department. I'm not a therapist. I don't have a license, but I've been a bit obsessed with the science of love for the past few years. As I tried to heal from my own anxious attachment style, I just kept reading and reading and reading and trying to figure out what is normal, what is love, um, how to say yes, when to say no, et cetera. And um, so I have a lot of knowledge I like to share, but again, if you have any mental health issues, I really encourage you to reach out and find a licensed therapist. This is not therapy. Okay, let's see some other questions. Um, so you're single and how do you believe again, you've been over it and same time wanting to retry. Okay, so this is the important thing. Heartbreak hurts. It hurts a lot. Well, you know that old saying, love hurts. It hurts a lot to get involved in a relationship, put your whole heart in and then learn some things about yourself, even if it's just your choices. And then that pain of separation. There may need to be a time of healing, a time to just remind yourself how lovable you are. Surround yourself by family, friends, and colleagues who speak to the highest part of who you are. But human beings are wired to bond. We are meant to be in close, intimate relationships and indeed tribes. And so I encourage you when you're ready to get on back. Um, you might want to assess what went wrong, what could you do differently this time, maybe get a partner as a, a therapist who can help you when you enter the dating world so you won't make some of the choice mistakes as before, um, but I encourage you to do it. Uh, okay, I see some comments now. Uh, oh, size back, hello. Okay, let's see who we've got up here, sorry. Uh, Oh, what a, what a question. Can a 40 year old woman find love? I'm told if you're not married by 35, you'll end up alone. Where do you live? What is your culture telling you? Okay, first of all, let me just say this. I mentioned that human beings are wired to bond. However, when till death do us part was invented, death was pretty in imminent. <laughs> intimate. It's intimate too, pretty imminent. If you got married in the year 1900, the average length of that marriage was 12 years because people were dying from pandemics and wars and all kinds of things. If you got married in 1990, not 1900, 1990, 90 years later, and you profess till death do us part, the average length of that marriage was also 12 years, but it ended because of divorce. Because of our very long life expectancies, even the most monogamous of humans may find themselves having two or three long stints of monogamy with some mate selection in between. Now, there is a single population of daters across the lifespan. So if somebody told you that you can't find love at 40, if you don't find love, it's because you believe it or because you've dipped yourself into the wrong mating pool. If you live in a small town where your mating marketplace is very small, then it can be a little harder. Or if you just go out there thinking, mm, no one's gonna love me because of my age, then that's gonna be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I found a very committed, deep, secure relationship in my 50s, and I'm thrilled. So it can be done at any age, at any place. Uh, I don't understand that question. Let's see. So does the old developmental stage of intimacy versus isolation go out the window? <laughs> does it have a wider time frame? Uh, so we're talking about Eric Erickson. I teach developmental psychology and he called the twenties, this time of intimacy versus isolation. Like if you don't find your mate and achieve intimacy, then you might be destined to a life of isolation. It doesn't go out the window. It's been repurposed and shifted, right? Even in my developmental uh, psychology class, we talk about women using technology to have babies in their 50s and 60s and how they might be doing a developmental stage that used to be in their 20s and it could be later. So these stages can shift. It doesn't get 
blown out the window. That's for sure. Uh, they would have still said it, but somebody would have died. Um, so that's a very too simple for me to answer. I'm sorry, am I not enough information? Uh, you're asking me if you're single, you're happy to be single. You love people, but you also love your solitude. You're not happy. You're not married. Sorry. You're happy. Is this a normal state of being? How can I get people to stop trying to fix me up? You got to send those people to other people who want to be people. It's, you know, there are many, many ways to be a human being. There's not a rule that says everyone must be married or everybody must be in a relationship. And I've had times of my life where for years I was single and very, very happy. Um, it's only abnormal if it causes pain to you or dysfunction to you. Who cares what everyone else thinks? Um, simple question. Is it worth trying to get out of the friend zone? You can always try, but let me tell you how to get out of the trend friend zone. So a guy in a woman's friend zone is the same as a woman who's in a situationship with a man. And let me explain the difference. When a woman's in a situationship, she's trying to be this nice, fun girl. She's just going to go over for sex. She's going to not cause a problem. She's going to try to convince him that he should just fall in love with her because she's so kind and nice and giving. And a man in the friend zone is the one who's being kind and nice and giving and not getting any sex. So the woman's not getting commitment. He's not getting sex. They're in different relationships, by the way, not together. They should find each other. They'd be great. Uh, so the only way, dudes, that you can get out of the friend zone is to stop giving. Obviously, you don't want to give her an ultimatum because that looks like you're begging. You just wean yourself off and be busy. And she'll be like, what happened to him? Where'd that guy go? And make sure your social media shows you out with hot girls having fun. And then she's like, wait a minute. He was being so nice and giving so much. You just got to move away. If you love something... Let it go. Uh, Sai is asking me, what do I, what, Wendy, what did you have for dinner? I have not eaten dinner yet. So I don't have a plan. I got to figure that out after this. Um, I'm sorry, it's not sliding anymore. Uh, I'm happy to hear that your ex-husband and you stayed friends for years. Uh, best way to, what would be the best way to gain a girl that you already slept with and bring her guard down and say yes to maybe actually dating? Okay. So uh, paraphrased, this question is, we move too fast into a physical relationship. And now I would like her to have an emotional relationship with me, right? So you start by modeling emotions, talking about your feelings and looking for her to reciprocate. You start by calling her up and treating her like a date, taking her out, treating her well, talking about the tender subjects. That's how you do it. Um, oh, excellent question. Someone says he's a bit feminine. Can he still be straight? Ah, this question makes me so frustrated because so many people don't understand, but I'm glad I have an opportunity to explain. Gender expression, gender identity, gender role, what you do, are a completely different separate department than sexual orientation. We have the widest range of sexual orientation. It's a scale. We have the widest range of gender. It's a scale. And so just because a male is feminine doesn't mean he's gay. And just because a female is masculine, it doesn't mean she's gay. In fact, the problem is, the reason why you think feminine men are gay is because for many, many years, most masculine expressing gay men, you never noticed. You couldn't see them. So you didn't know they were out there or they were in the closet, right? And so to associate gender identity or gender expression with sexual orientation is a big mistake. You never know until you know. Um, uh, 
Oh, somebody asked me about a session with me. So let me explain. I don't do sessions, consultations, therapy, treatment, none of that. I do phone calls uh, and they're, I'm sorry, they're pretty expensive because I'm so busy. So I only like to do one or two a week. Um, and uh, what I do is share my education on relationships. I share my personal experience. I'm like an educated friend who gives advice based on my life experience and my knowledge. Um, I don't diagnose or treat any mental illness. I will though, if I suspect your mental health is suffering, I will help you find a licensed therapist in your neighborhood. But I do friendly conversations. That's what um, I do one hour on the phone. And um, the way you do it is you go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Dr. Wendy Wallace. You join for as little as four bucks a month and then you send me a message on there. Um, patreon.com slash Dr. Wendy Walsh. I do a 15 minute live stream here every, it's usually Wednesdays, but I'm doing it Tuesday this week because I'm traveling tomorrow. And um, afterwards I go over to my Patreon private exclusive Zoom room where uh, we all get together, cameras on, and just talk about relationship topics if anything comes up. It's actually a group of really bright people. And so I love when they weigh in. Some are married, some are single, some are single parents. Um, they're from all over the world, but the shared obsession is the science of love. So they have lots of good advice as well as I love to um, give advice as well. Um, do I think people who find love are just lucky? Absolutely not. Relationships are far more about skill than luck. And I will tell you, so, you know, I, I had an anxious attachment style for a lot of years. I played all those crazy games and manipulated to try to get guys in. I try to get them jealous. I, I disappear for a while to try to make them call and chase me. I did all these silly game playing because my attachment style was so disorganized. In my case, it happened to be because my dad was in the Navy when I was a kid and he was gone in a very inconsistent pattern. So he'd be gone for a couple weeks on the ship, back for a few days, gone for a few months, back for a few weeks. And as a child, that deregulation of the inconsistent schedule created, because when he came back, he was a great dad and very much in love and very cared for me a lot. Uh, but when he, it, it created this model for love in my head that meant love was also mixed with longing. So I loved long distance relationships. I loved emotionally avoidant men who I could, I was trying to reel them in and get them to open up and all that stuff. But during my therapy, I started really reading books about attachment theory and learning about what I was experiencing. And as I read more and more research about the science of love, I also wanted to share it with the world. So I wrote three books. The Boyfriend Test was the first one, then The Girlfriend Test, and then most recently, The 30-Day Love Detox. And um, it was like, as I was healing, I was also getting really, really educated. And I love to share my education. I teach psychology now. I'm not a therapist. Um, but I have a very secure, wonderful, loving relationship that is unlike any relationship I've had in my life. It is authentic. I can literally say anything and not worry that he'll leave or I'll be judged. And he's the same way. He's completely open with me. And I'm not running away from that. So, you know, part of the anxious attachment is kind of an anxious ambivalence. When you finally get someone who's actually kind and nice and emotionally intimate, uh, you run away when they show up because it doesn't fit your model of love. So I think it's incumbent on everybody who wants to find love to understand their model for love and understand that as much as you think some people out there are bad or treating you bad, really gently, I wanna remind you that you chose them. You chose them because you believed that that was what love should feel like. And I'll tell you what love should feel like. Not that roller coaster, not the highs and the lows, not all the butterflies in your stomach, that's anxiety, folks. It should feel like peace, it should feel like safety. It should feel full of trust and security. And I'm happy to tell you, I certainly have that now. Anyway, I'm going over to my Patreon now. If you'd like to join me, come on over. You just go to patreon.com slash Dr. Wendy Walsh. We have a Zoom room that meets every week. It's usually Wednesday nights, but tonight it's Tuesday. And um, it's wonderful. 
Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Dr. Wendy Walsh. I love you all. Thanks for being here. Oh, listen to my radio show on Sundays on KFI AM 640 Los Angeles every Sunday from 4 to 7 p.m. It just extended to one extra hour. So it's three hours every Sunday. And you can listen on the iHeartRadio app and you can call in with your questions. Good to see you all. Take care. Bye.